Okay, we're, in, we're looking at Revelation 17. Uh, we'll probably be in it for a little while. Two or three messages, maybe more. <laughs> uh, we're entitling this uh, an alternate uh, explanation for Babylon. Because Babylon, some scholars say Babylon's a code word for Rome, but I don't believe that is what we have here in the scriptures given to us. <clears throat> anyway, as I said, there are many scholars on both sides. So uh, we're not going to build a new church over it or anything like that. So we'll just present this alternate version of the meaning of Babylon, which we hope to do over two or three lessons. Can't do it all tonight. But we begin with Zechariah. In the book of Zechariah, in the first six chapters of Zechariah, we have um, Zechariah has a number of night visions. He has eight of them all together, and there they are on the screen. We have the riders and the horses among the myrtle trees. Not our objective to, to explain all these tonight, because that's not what I'm studying. Then we have the four horns and the four craftsmen. Then we have the man with the measuring line. <coughs> Then we have the cleansing of the high priest Joshua. And then we have lampstands and the olive tree. Then we have the flying scroll, which is in the same context that we're studying tonight. And the flying scroll is the message that God gives to Israel that he will uh, judge their persistent uh, wickedness, which is uh, being committed by some of the returning remnant from the Babylonian captivity. Then we have the woman in the basket. And the woman in a basket is Zechariah 5, 5 through 11. And one of the helpful aspects of this particular vision, it mentions uh, the destination of this woman in the basket. It's going to be the land of Shina. And the land of Shina uh, is a locale mentioned in a handful of scriptures in the Bible. And it's in that region which we know as Babel or uh, later on Babylon. And then we have the four chariots vision. And then there's a conclusion, which I haven't got up there, but there are the eight visions. And then there's a conclusion to the eight visions, which is given in Zechariah 6, 9 through 15. And that's the crowning of Joshua. And so the, the night visions. We're looking at the appearance of the basket. <clears throat> and Zechariah 5, then the angel, this is the interpreting angel, well, the guiding angel, whatever you want to call him, he's going to interpret these visions to Zechariah. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now your eyes and see what is this that goes forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is the basket that goes forth. So Zechariah sees this basket. Some of your translations may refer to it as an ephah. So, uh, and the ephah, of course, was the largest measurement in the Old Testament, typically used for the measuring out of dry grain like flour and barley. And, of course, the basket itself signifies commercial activity. And, of course, the Jews, after their, not all of them, but some, the Jews after their captivity, they cornered the grain market in Babylon. And as part of their way of getting rich, they made the ephah smaller than it should be and still charged the Babylonians the cost of a standard ephah of grain. And while they became rich, the means by which they obtained their wealth, of course, violated the third and the eighth commandments, which is what the flying scroll was all about. And on one side of the flying scroll, was the third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain, which means that it was common practice for these Jews, uh, again, not the whole nation, but some of these uh, in their commercial practice, it was common practice to swear by God that they were going to do something good, and then deliberately they would break the contract. And so in other words, uh, they were cheating the victim, they were fleecing the victim, they were breaking their oath to be honest. And that's why on the other side of the scroll, the flying scroll, thou shalt not steal. And of course, that's a reference to the fact that they were using corrupt uh, commercial practices or they were stealing from the people, just to put it plainly. Stealing from the people. Either way, by stealing, 
or by deliberately not keeping the oath that they had made, to be honest, uh, then these people were going to be disciplined. And so we read, continuing with the vision we're looking at now, and uh, in verse 6b, and he said, moreover, this, that is the basket that Zechariah sees in this vision, is there, that is the Jewish people, appearance, or some translations may say the iniquity, uh, through all the earth. And the Hebrew word for earth, hmm? Yeah, resemblance, uh, uh, and, and it's at the, um, the uh, I'm trying to think of the Septuagint, in, in its translation, sometimes refer to this appearance or resemblance as back to this idea of iniquity, going back to the reference to the flying scroll itself. <clears throat> so this vision shows that this wickedness was going to be, to some extent, held at bay, held in check during Zechariah's day. And so the angel continues uh, to explain this uh, vision about this woman in the basket. And of course, no ephah, no basket, of course, would be large enough to house a person, of course, just as that flying scroll was itself about 9 metres by 4.5 metres, and it was flying. So <laughs> these are just symbolic visions that are being portrayed to Zechariah. And likewise, this basket that he sees uh, is in this particular case is large enough to enclose a woman in this symbolic uh, uh, visual that he's looking at and it's airborne it's flying and so and it says and I beheld there was lifted up a cover of lead and there was a woman that sits in the midst of the basket and he said this is wickedness so we have to uh, interpret this symbolically the woman represents wickedness. The wickedness is actually the translation says, this is the wickedness. And he cast her into the midst of the basket and he cast the cover of lead upon its mouth. So the basket had a cover of lead, obviously a weight of giant proportions in order to keep the woman enclosed in the basket, not allowing her to escape. This was to assure the contents of this basket, which is wickedness. And when the cover was lifted and uh, the woman was observed inside, the angel identified it as wickedness, literally, as I said, the wickedness, a term denoting both civil, ethical and religious evil. And as soon as the angel identified, the interpreting angel identified this to Zechariah, uh, the angel pushed her back in the basket and slammed down and secured the lid over its mouth. In other words, God was not going to allow this, the wickedness, to escape during Zechariah's day. So the woman's incarceration then limits her activities, preventing her from spreading further evil throughout Israel. And the incarceration of the woman in, bas in the basket signifies that God is sovereign. God is in control of this, and he will release the woman from the basket in accordance with his timetable, according to his plan. And the ultimate removal, as we see of this wickedness, is going to be towards the end of the world. It'll take place before the millennial reign. In other words, it'll take place during the tribulational period. And so we go on, and, and the removal of the basket starts now to take off, starts to fly. And after the prophet sees what's inside, we read, Then I lifted up my eyes, and I looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. Now when we consider the, again, this uh, image, this vision, it, uh, it seems best to understand, obviously, that the two winged women who are carrying this basket, as well as the image of the woman in the basket, are uh, just symbolic rather than not literal because we've already been told that considering the woman in the basket, this is the wickedness. And likewise, we don't expect a literal woman in a literal basket carried by these feminine figures with wings like stork flying all the way to China. So why, why like stork? Because the... <laughs> The stork 
is a migratory bird. And as a migratory bird, uh, because of its wings, it's able to cover long distances. And that's the picture we have here. The simile wings like those of a stork is intended to show that the winged women are carry, carried along by the wind, as the passage says. They're capable of supporting this woman, the wickedness, in the basket and supporting and carrying her, carrying her over a long distance, just as these storks, these migratory birds, would be able to do. And as the basket is lifted up off the ground, Zechariah asks, Then said I to the angel that talked to me, Where do these take the basket? And the angel said, To build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon its own base. So part of this vision then is identifying a specific geographical location that the woman will one day operate from and uh, when she's released from this imprisonment, from this incarceration, in other words, evil will have its headquarters in the land of Shinar in Babylon. And the Old Testament, of course, repeatedly identifies Shinar uh, in the exact same place where we know we had the Tower of Babel as well as where historic Babylon itself stood. And so Shinar, occur, the word Shinar occurs seven times in the Old Testament. And as we uh, read here by Charles Feinberg, the first mention of Shinar in the Bible is in Genesis 10, verse 10. It is found in all six other times, gives the list there. In all instances where it occurs, it is used as a definite geographical designation. Strictly speaking, it covers more than Babylon, but it is employed to denote this land. And of course, we know some of those references refer to the Tower of Babel itself, as we read back there in Genesis uh, 11 verses 1 through 4. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. <clears throat> then said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used bricks for stone and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach unto heaven. In other words, they thought, well, he got us by the flood the first time. We're going to build a big city that no flood can cover. And let us build ourselves a city whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth, which is what God's commandment was. Go abroad and repopulate the earth. They wanted to stay where they were. That's why God confused their languages and they had to scatter because they couldn't understand each other anymore so they scattered as and they say god had them one way or another to fulfill his original commandment there <clears throat> and of course we know shina of course is associated with babylon in the third year of the reign of jehoiakim king of judah nebuchadnezzar king of babylon came to jerusalem and besieged it the lord gave jehoiakim king of judah into his hand along with some of the vessels of the house of god and he brought them to the land of shina to the house of his god and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Because you know the story there, Belshazzar wanted to take those vessels to drink out of, and that's when we have the handwriting on the wall. You know, that's another story. So we have um, Shiner, of course. Uh, that's the Hebrew word. In the Greek, it is Mesopotamia, as we have on this map here. Mesopotamia, the word Mesa means middle. Potamia means rivers. So Mesopotamia is referring to a place between two rivers. And the two rivers, of course, are the Tigris and the Euphrates River. This is Mesopotamia, reference to China, or in that, uh, I do not show up too well there, but uh, it's supposed to be yellow and pink, in that yellow area, in other words, modern-day Iraq, where, of course, is also located Babylon. And so we have these uh, references being made then to China. So biblically speaking then, wickedness is taken out of Israel, as we see in this vision, and it's put back to where it all began, in the land of Shinar. So God's 
bringing it back to the beginning where he's going to finally uh, bring his plan and purposes to a close. So this vision or prophecy contain, is, is going to afterwards be explained in our passage when we get to it tonight, developed in a little bit more detail in Revelations chapter 17 and Revelations chapter 18, where it's shown that the house that we mentioned in the previous verse in Zechariah, the house which is established uh, for this system of commerce is going to be Babylon the Great. And so we have, and when we talk about Babylon, Babylon, of course, uh, uh, after 539 BC, uh, there is still, in, we still have some, a lot of references being made to Babylon. We'll discuss some of these further down the track. Like some of these references we have uh, here, we have uh, Alexander the Great visits and dies in Babylon in 323 BC. We have, um, an interesting one we'll mention later on, the Babylonians were present on Pentecost in Acts 2.9. And we have the Talmud promulgated uh, from uh, Babylon. And uh, then, of course, Babylon known as Tumos and Hala in AD 1100. So references are still being made down through history of regarding Babylon itself. <coughs> Henry Morris says, <coughs> Henry Morris says, Zechariah's vision thus clearly foretells a time when the centre of world finance and commerce will be removed from its bases in New York, blah, 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 and other great cities and transported quickly across the world to a new foundation and headquarters in the land of China modern-day Iraq. And, of course, that would be, that's easily understandable because uh, we've studied the Gog and Magog. Russia will be gone. All the Muslim nations will be gone. Iran's gone because they're part of the Gog and Magog. And so Iraq and all the oil supplies around it, who wants to control it? The rising Antichrist. Where's a better place to set up his headquarters? modern-day Iraq, and so he can control the oil, he can control the world, and one of the, one of the ways in which, can, which he can do that. So all of, the, all of these visions are in Zechariah then, they refer to some future event, and as uh, again reading Charles Feinberg, now the prophet Zechariah foretells that in the last days of wickedness, with idolatry particularly in mind, Give some references there that will be existent in Israel at that time will go back forcibly to the place of its origin Babylon the great apostate religious system such is the meaning of being settled on our own base when we come to the book of Revelation all of this is closely set forth in chapter 17 and 18 not only the evil in Judaism but that in Christendom as well will wind up and culminate in that abominable system called mystical or mystery Babylon, the greatest sin in Israel, even wickedness itself, was idolatry. It will come to its settled abode at the very place of its inception. So back to the beginning. <clears throat> it's, very, it's very also very interesting. It may, we, we're, not, we're not going to build a church on this either. Because uh, if, you read, if you read Genesis, the Euphrates River is mentioned as coming out from the Garden of Eden. So there was the Garden of Eden located in China or around this Iraq area. And of course all that would have disappeared with the flood and so forth. So you can't go and find the, the Garden of Eden or anything. So it's interesting also that uh, again way back there, the devil probably had his headquarters there. And that's where he tempted Adam and Eve. And of course that's where it all began. And then it's continued on into Babel, Babylon, and so on, will reach its heyday when it is restored in some capacity, some form or another. And so uh, we see some analogies, uh, which we'll bring up as we develop the series a little bit further. In Zechariah 5, 5 through 11, compared to Revelation 17 and 18, the woman sitting in a basket, Revelation 17 and 18 talks about a woman sitting on the beast, seven mountains and many waters. Emphasis on commerce, a basket for measuring grain. In Revelation 17 and 18, emphasis on commerce, talks about the merchants of grain. The woman's name is wickedness, 
In Revelation 7 and 18, the woman's name is Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Focus on false worship. Uh, focus, of course, on false worship in Revelation 17 as well. The woman is taken to Babylon. The woman is called Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18. So the woman then represents the harlot of Babylon in Revelation 17, also sometimes referred to as the mystery of iniquity. This is the wickedness that we mentioned about before. And so another analogy is that during this church age in which we live, that lead covering, as it were, that restrains the woman in the basket, that restrains the wickedness, uh, represents in our church age God the Holy Spirit because he's restraining because the Antichrist is not going to be exposed until the spirit is taken out of the way. Uh, that, that just means the church is taken out of the way because the Holy Spirit can't be taken out from the planet because he's still in the tribulation to convict people of sin, righteousness and judgment to come. And that's why we read in, uh, re in, that's why we read in 2 Thessalonians 2.7 for the mystery of, iniquitous, uh, of, of iniquity or the mystery of lawlessness or wickedness does already work, as we know. I think the Lord, that the Holy Spirit's restraining it. I think things are bad enough now. Once we're taken out of the way of the church age, when it says the Spirit's taken out of the way because the Spirit indwells the believers, so it's taken out of the way in that sense. Only he, and is referring to the Holy Spirit, who now restrains will do so until he be taken out of the way. So the Holy Spirit is keeping things in check to some degree, restraining the rise of the man of sin. Satan always has his man of sin of some sort in place because he doesn't know when the rapture is going to occur, so he always has some man on the scene. Way back then they thought it was Napoleon, some people thought it was Hitler, and who else they may have thought of, we don't know. But Satan has his man somewhere to rise when the church is taken out of this planet. So the lid, of course, is going to be removed in the tribulation uh, with the rapture of the church and the woman, the wickedness, is going to come out. And that coming out, of course, is given to us in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. <clears throat> now, conservative scholars, as we said, some people are concerning Babylon future. Some say it will not be rebuilt. Others say it will. Uh, but it certainly would be a great place for the Antichrist to set up his headquarters to control those oil supplies around Iraq. As one, Graham Morris again says, computer studies of the Institute for Creation Research have shown, for example, that Babylon is very near the geographical centre of all the Earth's land masses. It is within navigable distances of the Persian Gulf and is at the crossroads of the three great continents of Europe, Asia and Africa. Thus, there is no more ideal location anywhere for a world trade centre, a world communication centre, a world banking centre, a world educational centre, or especially a world capital. The greatest historian of modern times, Arnold Toynbee, used to stress to all his readers and hearers that Babylon would be the best place in the world to build a future world and cultural metropolis. And John, Dr. John Walford says, now we'll look at these prophecies in Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51 down the track. But regarding those prophecies, prophecies found in those four passages, he says, As far as the historic fulfilment is concerned, it is obvious from both scriptures and history that these verses, he's talking about the verses in Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51, these verses have not been literally fulfilled. The city of Babylon continued to flourish after the Medes conquered it, and though its glory dwindled, especially after the control of the Medes and the Persians ended in, 30, and then in 323 BC, the city continued in some form or substance until AD 1000 and did not experience a sudden termination such as was anticipated in the prophecy given in those passages there. But it will come to a sudden termination in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. And of course, uh, we read this. This is something a little bit more recent. This is uh, July the 6th, 2019. It says, 
Iraq on Friday celebrated the UNESCO World Heritage Committee's decision to name the historic city of Babylon a World Heritage Site in a vote held in, and we have pronounced that as the Bajan's capital. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, uh, years after Baghdad began campaigning for the site to be added to the list, the 4,300 year old Babylon now mainly an archaeological ruin and two important museums, is where dynasties have risen and fallen since the earliest days of settled human civilization. King Hammurabi wrote his famous Code of Laws in Babylon, while Nebuchadnezzar sent his vast army from the city to Jerusalem to put down an uprising and bring the Jews back as slaves. Even though it's a little bit dated, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't able to copy these slides because I couldn't, didn't have to, I couldn't figure out how to copy uh, slides off a visual presentation, but uh, if you go to this site, uh, khanacademy.org, you'll get a visual tour of ancient Babylon, its excavations, its restorations, and modern tourism. And also, you can download, I've only got one copy here, you can also download a transcript of the... Um, of the dialogue as it goes through uh, this visual presentation. But in, in saying that, other things are happening in Mesopotamia around this area uh, where we have this city of Babylon located. Because you remember again in, Ve in, Ze in Zechariah 5.11, it says, And he said unto me to build it a house in the land of China, this may preempting uh, some of the things that will happen in the tribulation because they're not there yet, but something is happening at this present moment. There are house or houses being built in the land of China. And as it goes on to say, it shall be established and set there upon its own base. So there are houses being built of satanic spiritual quality. And of course, we have the Abrahamic family house in Abu Dhabi, which is due to open sometime 2022 and I'll read I didn't put it on the slide I'll read what the site says it says this project is to unite the three faiths of Judaism Islam and Christendom this is the United Arab Emirates not that far from Babylon it will be a beacon of mutual understanding harmonious coexistence and peace among people of faith and goodwill it consists of a mosque, a church, a synagogue, and an educational centre to be built on, there's one of those words again, Sadiat Island, the cultural centre of Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Through its design, it captures the values shared between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and serves as a powerful platform for inspiring and nurturing understanding and acceptance between people of goodwill. The vision, of course this is uh, someone's uh, uh, portrayal of what it will look like when it's finished, a virtual model there of the future. Uh, the vision for the Abrahamic family house originated after the signing of the document on human fraternity by Pope Francis and another one of these big names the Grand Imam Ahmed al Tayeb in February 2019. And the names of the three mosques for worship have been revealed as Imam, named after that guy, of course, Imam al Tayeb Mosque, obviously, St. Francis Church, and the Moses Ben Maimon Synagogue. So we're living in a time period where some of these religious centres of the earth are moving to the Middle East in that area which we know as modern day Iraq. So things are sort of building up to something and blowing in the wind, <laughs> as we'd say. Well, Babylon. Babylon is introduced, of course, to us again uh, in the book of Revelation. And before we start, just say, I've got, I haven't got that particular map, but if you want uh, God's prophetic ca uh, ca calendar, 
which in this particular case was designed by the Friends of Israel, Dr. Jim Showers. I've got something a little bit different to that. But on, on, but on this one here, we see... Now how do we get this... Uh, that little red thing that moves around on the screen? That, that middle thing, is it? Okay, right oh, There we go, church age. Of course, we're going to go one day. We don't know when. Up we go, rapture. The exit, resurrection. Ex anastasis. Exit resurrection. We'll be with Christ, which will take place, the judgment seat, where we'll be rewarded or lose rewards, involved in the marriage of the Lamb. And then uh, while all this is happening, seven years down here on earth, Israel's time clock is switched back on, according to Daniel's prophecy. Seven years of tribulation, halfway through which we have the Antichrist sets himself up into the yet-to-be-rebuilt temple and claim himself to be God. And then, of course, we'd have that last three and a half years, the worst period of anti-Semitism. Jesus Christ will return, as we've been looking at in the Armageddon campaign study and so forth. And then the 1,000 years of millennial reign. And, of course, and also we have periods of judgment. Uh, during the church age, unbelievers go to a holding pen called Hades, actually the place of... Oh, pressed the wrong button then. And where am I going? Am I going the wrong way now? I've lost that. Here we go. Uh, they go into Hades, the place of torments. And uh, so likewise, unbelievers during the tribulation go into this holding pen. And at the, at the end of the tribulation, another judgment takes place that's where Satan and his fallen angels are cast into Hades, a different imprisonment, the bottomless pit that Revelation 20 talks about. And then at the end of the millennium, they, they are all brought back up for the great white throne judgment. And then finally, their final resting place, the lake of fire. And of course, we have the new heaven and a new earth. So they're not just ramming around up there in heaven. There's going to be a new earth. In the millennium, it's a restored earth. And in the eternity, a new earth, as well as a new heaven. And uh, so that's an outline of God's plan as revealed to us in his word. And that's what we see in Revelation, as, in our studies of Revelation. Uh, and of course, we're up to Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. And when you, when you study the book of Revelation, we have, of course, it was written in the order in which truth was revealed to John, but it's not written in the actual order in which things occur. What we have is we have these uh, parenthetical inserts that occur throughout the book. And so we uh, do, we do, uh, I don't, oh, I don't tell you, I haven't got that slide on the screen. That's unfortunate. Okay. We do have these parenthetical inserts throughout the book of uh, Revelation. And uh, so that we have, for example, at the end of the sixth seal judgment, we have an insert that explains the uh, 144,000. And then when we get to the sixth trumpet judgment, there's another parenthetical insert, in other words, flashbacks, just like you see in movies sometimes, flashbacks to fill in what's taking place. There's a flashback. And there's an insert to explain that... Uh, phenomenon of the two witnesses. And then, of course, in the, at the end of that uh, uh, seventh trumpet, we have another parenthetical insert which explains Israel, her flight into the wilderness, which we've talked about to some degree. And then we come to the bowl judgments, and at the end of the sixth bowl judgment, we have another parenthetical insert where the interpreting angel briefly explains this uh, Armageddon campaign. And then at the end of the seventh bold judgment, where John has talked about the destruction of Babylon, he goes on to explain, well, why was it destroyed? So we have another parenthetical insert, and that's Revelation chapter 17 and Revelation chapter 18, before John continues, which is going to be the next great event after the destruction of Babylon, which would be the return of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. 
And so we have, and there came, there came uh, one of these uh, uh, seven angels who had the seven bowls, and he talked with me, and he's going to uh, show uh, John some of these things that are happening, uh, why uh, this particular uh, city was destroyed. And he's going to talk about, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. And he's going to talk about, talk about that. And when he talks about uh, this judgment of the uh, great harlot, he uh, also uh, is going to uh, mention, uh, if we jump, hello. <laughs> Good to have you. <laughs> so we, he, he talks about this uh, this judgment that comes upon Babylon, and then when we get to the end of these explanations, he's going to issue the command in Revelation Revelation eighteen twenty, where he talks about rejoice over her, you heavens, for God has avenged you on her. I think my slides are a bit out of order here. Ah, oh, there it is. There, I must have missed a few. Okay. So he says in Revelation 18:20, "Rejoice over her, O heaven! Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets! God has judged her for the way she treated you." And then he's going to go on and talk about the Hallelujah chorus in Revelation chapter 19. We haven't got the words, but uh, there's this heaven. Heaven's Hallelujah Chorus, which I'll read some of it for you. And this Hallelujah Chorus is proclaimed in response to God's defeat, God's destruction of Babylon, which is initiated by, through the prayers of the tribulational martyrs, continued by the 24 elders and the four living creatures, and a great crescendo of Hallelujahs to include all the saints throughout the periods of history. And so Revelation 19, 1 says, And after these things I heard a great voice of many people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. And of course, that's in response to that rejoice in Revelation 18. Verse 2, For true and righteous are his judgments, for he has judged the great harlot, who did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. An answer to the prayers of the saints from Revelation 6 which we studied so long back. Verse 3 And again they said, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever and the four and twenty elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And verse 5 And the voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and you that fear him, both small and great. Verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, probably referring to the saints from all ages of history, and I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigns, because he will reign for those 1,000 years. So we have this great prostitute. Who is she? The great Babylon, the harlot. Babylon the great. Well we know again in Revelation 17 1, this great prostitute or harlot that uh, John talks about is going to be the same woman he speaks of in verses 3 through 7 of Revelation 17 and her name in verse 5 is given as Babylon the great and in verse 18 we see that Babylon is actually a city. Verse 18, verse 18 says, And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. <coughs> so the harlot then is actually the city of Babylon in the last days to reign over the <coughs> kings of the earth. Again, the question remains again. Some scholars say Babylon won't be rebuilt. Some say it will. And so we have to ask the question, do we understand these verses literally, which I do, or do we, as some say, Bab no, Babylon's a code word for Rome? But you have to ask yourself, every other place that's mentioned in Revelation 
is taken literally. Patmos is Patmos. It's not some code word for some other place. Ephesus is Ephesus. Smyrna is Smyrna. Pergamum is Pergamon. Thyatira is Thyatira. Sardis is Sardis. Philadelphia is Philadelphia. Laodicea is Lazat. And the Euphrates River. Not a code word for something else. It's the Euphrates River. And so it seems that uh, we should also look at uh, Babylon as to be taken literally. Again, as Henry Morris says, it must be stressed again that revelation means unveiling, not veiling. In the absence of any statement in the context of the contrary, therefore, we must assume that the term Babylon applies to the real city of Babylon, although it may extend far beyond that to the whole system centred at Babylon as well, you know, Mesopotamia, that modern day Iraq. And then, of course, we have Peter writing, as it says, from Babylon. And again, if you take Babylon as a code word, people say he's writing from Rome. And we read, we read there in 1 Peter 5.13, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. And so we have, uh, again, uh, if I pronounce his right, right, right name properly, Frutenborn. It says, at this point in time, Babylonia, that's the time when Peter was writing that epistle, Babylonia was the centre of Judaism outside the land. It is also the place where the Babylonian Talmud developed. And since Peter was the apostle to the circumcision, it makes perfect sense that he would have travelled to Babylon after he left the land. He literally wrote the letter from Babylon, the centre of Judaism outside the land. And what we also know is, at Pentecost, what do we have? At Pentecost, of course, we have people from Mesopotamia, from modern-day Iraq, Babylon, coming to Pentecost to hear that good news. And so we have uh, in Revelation 17, Revelation 17, 1 then, it talks about, in Revelation 17, 18, it talks about Babylon is the city, the harlot is the city. And, of course, in Revelation 17 and 18, <laughs> again, some commentators think it's talking about two different cities. It's talking about one city that has a, a religious aspect, it has a commercial aspect, and we can see some of the differences here, which we'll study as we progress over time through these two chapters. They have the same name, talks about the same city, mentions, describes the same clothing, talks about holding a cup, fornicating with kings, drunk with wine of immorality, persecuting believers, destroyed by fire, destroyed by God. So we have all these, all these similarities taking place. So Babylon, and it says, Babylon, it says, it talks about this harlot, this uh, uh, religious uh, city, this Babylon, it says in Revelation 17.1 that she sits by or upon many waters. Probably better to translate it as by rather than the pond because she's also sitting on the beast. And so she's sitting by these waters and she's sitting on the beast. Later described in verse 15, we don't have to make these things up. The Bible interprets itself. What are these waters that she's sitting by? It says in Revelation 17 uh, verse 15, it says there, the waters are people, multitudes, and nations, and tongues. In other words, the whole world. The whole world is going to be intoxicated by this idolatrous religious <coughs> system. You've got, to, you've, got to, again, you've got to remember there's a big void taking place here when the rapture occurs. I don't know how many believers there are in the world, but a third. You know, there's going to be a lot of people disappear. And then you have more people disappear in the Gog-Magog warfare. And then when the seal judgments occur, more people are going to be killed. So uh, there's this great void taking place. So very easy for someone to step into this void and control, have an influence over what's left of this known world and its people, multitudes, nations and tongues. So the influence of Babylon, verse 2, talks about the influence of Babylon it says, with whom the kings of the earth have, have committed fornication. That's unfaithfulness to the true God. And the inhabitants of the earth, these are sometimes we <coughs> what we refer to as the earth dwellers. 
they are holding on to the earth in the sense that no matter what happens during the seal, the trumpet and the bowl judgments, they are earthbound. They will never ever repent of their sin. They remain uh, as unbelievers. And the, and the inhabitants of the earth, the earth dwellers, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So verse 2 reveals that all levels, all levels of society, from the kings, meaning the rulers of the earth, uh, to the rest of earth's inhabitants, have committed fornication with this religious system, this great prostitute. And so we have this uh, thing taking place at the end, near the end of the uh, first half of the tribulation and on into the second half. So they follow these earth dwellers, they follow the rulers of the earth, they're influenced by them, and at the same time they are corrupted by the religious influence of this Babylonian system. So Babylon is going to gain worldwide domination <coughs> by permeating every, every level of society, kings of the earth, rulers of the earth, general population will commit fornication, that's in the religious sense, the spiritual sense, unfaithfulness, but that, that's why the, the Antichrist so easily sets himself as, as the God, they will worship him, so they commit this fornication with the Babylonian system of religion, even to the point of being becoming intoxicated by it because they are lusting after false gods. Even in, I think, at the end of one of those seal judgments, it talks about how they're still making these idols of wood and stone and so on. So they're worshipping these false gods, and eventually they worship the false god, the wickedness, the Antichrist himself. So the angel has announced the, the harlot. He's talked about the influence of the harlot. Now he talks about the alliance of the harlot, and he says, the interpreting angel, so he carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet coloured beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns <coughs> and that word carried me away in the spirit of the wilderness takes us back we might look at this sometime in our studies takes us back to the oracles regarding this in Isaiah chapter 21 where in verse 1 it talks about the oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea and Babylon again between the two rivers. And in the context it's talking about Babylon. Isaiah is prophesying that fallen, fallen is Babylon, which is prophesying which what the writer here is going to say in Revelation 17 and 18. So in all of these things, the woman on the beast is not Rome. Rome is not in the wilderness. Rome is a beautiful city. Babylon, however, is in that area around modern-day Iraq. And who is the woman? Revelation 17, Revelation 17, 18 tells us, first of all, and the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And she's called a city five more times in Revelation 18. 18, 2, it talks about Babylon the Great. 18, 10, that great city Babylon, that mighty city. 1816, that great city. 1818, this great city. 1890, that great city. 1821, that great city Babylon. And, uh, and so these two, these two chapters then are presenting to us a city that has this same name. The name is Babylon. And who is the beast? Well, the beast, of course, the beast is the one that comes out from the sea, as we've studied in the past. And we read in Revelation 13, 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Notice it mentions seven heads and ten horns in Revelation 17 there, verse 3. Having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. That's an addition there we'll look at later on. And upon his head... The name of blasphemy, whereas in Revelation 17, 3, it talks about, <coughs> it talks about there, about full of names of blasphemy. Here we see, and upon the heads, the names of blasphemy. So blasphemous names goes on to show us that he will claim himself 
to be eventually the God. And so he says, I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet coloured beast. That adds a little bit extra information here. And, uh, and the word scarlet, of course, reminds us of what Revelation 12 talks about, the red dragon, because he's going to influence the beast, the Antichrist, there's war in heaven in Revelation 12. Satan is cast down to the earth and he will indwell the Antichrist because as we see in Isaiah 14, I will be like the most God. I want to be worshipped. And eventually he'll get that and partly come true when the Antichrist sets himself up as the God halfway through the tribulation in the yet to be rebuilt temple. <clears throat> so the beast then is described as scarlet in appearance. And that's the situation during the first half of the tribulation because the Antichrist is going to use this religious system to rise to power. And when he's got the power, I no longer need the system. I'm going to destroy it. I am it. I'm the system. And he sets himself up as the God in the temple yet to be built in the tribulation. So he will use the religious system to rise to power and the, be the, the, the woman riding the beast is something like a rider-horse situation. The horse is supporting the rider until such times I'm going to buck you off. And the Antichrist, I'm going to buck you off. I no longer need you. I've got my power and therefore I will become the one who's now going to be worshipped. I'm the one now who's going to be deified and uh, we've studied that and we'll continue to study that in Revelation 7 and 18. <clears throat> Better bring this to a close. Didn't get very far, but uh, we will see just as a preview of coming attractions towards the end of Revelation 17. <laughs> we won't get there uh, for some time, but in Revelation we see where the Antichrist uh, gets rid of this religious system. And so we read in Revelation 17, 16 and 17, and the ten horns, yet to explain that, which you saw upon the beast, they shall hate the harlot, and they shall make her desolate and naked, and they shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Graphic language, which we need to explain. For God has put in their hearts. They thought they were destroying the religious system, but it was God's plan and purpose to plant that thought, as it were, to carry his plan and purposes out. For God has put in their hearts to fulfil his will, and to agree and give their kingdoms unto the beast. That's something to be explained, but that's down the track. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. So is the angel... Getting complicated, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the, the angel is explaining then to John that it is going to be God who will put these purposes in the Antichrist's mind and the kings or rulers have given themselves over to him as part of his kingdom <clears throat> to be worshipped and of course he's going to destroy this religious system and he will become the one who is worshipped also prophesied of course by Daniel 11:36, and it says and the king <clears throat> shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the wrath is accomplished, the end of the tribulation, when God will cast him into the lake of fire. For what has been determined shall be done. God's plan. Of course, the saints in the tribulation will say, How long, O Lord? Oh, only another three and a half years plus before. <laughs> so he's still got a lot to suffer still yet. And it's planned. for what has been determined shall be done. Paul carries the prophecy on in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. He says, talking about the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God. What temple? The yet to be built, the, well, the yet to be built tribulational temple. Uh, hasn't been, of course, built yet. <laughs> But it won't take long in this modern day technology. And he just goes up with all these prefabricated materials, not, not built in the glory of previous temples, just as Babylon won't be rebuilt in the glory of Babylon Empire, anything like that, but it'll be, become a city of headquarters for the Antichrist to rule from. 
So who exposes, who opposes and exalts above all that is called God <coughs> or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And he wanted to be that Satan, Lucifer. I will be like the most high God. And of course, so Babylon itself then, with all its political and commercial influences, will continue uh, under the rule of the Antichrist for another three and a half years after he sits himself up in the temple until it is destroyed through the seventh Baal judgment. And then, of course, that will be near the end of the tribulation where God will return and rule and reign for those 1,000 years. Well, as they say in the cartoons, that's all, folks. And, uh, <laughs> until next time, we'll pick it up from there. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.